The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Thanks very much. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, the session should be interactive. We don't have a lot of people here, and there are sometimes questions that people have that they don't get around to ask, asking if they wait till the end. So I've never been a big fan of waiting till the end. Uh, so just ask me. Uh, we can make it very conversational. The whole notion is to have you understand some of the key issues around patents as they relate to the Linux community, the open source community at large, open source as a modality for invention, uh, and uh, the success of Linux as it marches from uh, the back office transaction processing. A lot, of, a lot of what the public, the uninitiated public doesn't see to places like the G phone uh, and other environments, uh, Ubuntu, uh, where it's certainly much more visible from the public standpoint. So for an agenda, we'll essentially be, uh, we'll just kind of talk about the context of how this, there's a secondary market that's been created for patenting and how that secondary market has emerged uh, and what it means in terms of the rise of trolls, how their activity has become actually much more virulent uh, over the last uh, five to seven years, some of the leading trolls, some of the activities they've been involved in vis-a-vis -vis Linux, how those activities have been addressed by the community, uh, some of the things that, uh, uh, that are happening in uh, traditional patent companies that also have impact on, on how uh, intellectual property, intellectual asset management, uh, rights management should and could occur in the Linux community. Uh, I think there's a, a little bit of a, a, a merger of interest there. And uh, while we start out, uh, uh, the community, the open source community certainly starts out extremely uh, antagonistic toward the notion of patenting. I think there are uh, activities short of patenting that can be quite beneficial. I'll talk about those. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Open Invention Network to be able to uh, ensure that uh, patents don't create a uh, have a negative impact on the, uh, the ecosystem and on the migration that I talked about earlier uh, from the back office to more visible application environments that, uh, uh, that uh, people get uh, uh, very emotional about, uh, such as the desktop and the, uh, the portable devices that are an extension, increasingly an extension of the desktop. I think everybody understands the benefits of, uh, of, op of open source and, uh, and, uh, and Linux. I think we've got much more opportunity for innovation. There's some good articles actually in, uh, in last week's or yeah, just the week that just ended or is ending today based on when they published. The, uh, the, the Economist uh, did a section, special section on innovation and how open source and Linux is creating uh, new dynamics and more iterative innovation that's more cost effective, uh, yields higher levels of innovation and uh, is iterative so that it, it creates uh, higher levels of, uh, of, uh, of, of thought uh, around, around uh, common problems in terms of applications of services. The, uh, the key for me is that when I took on this uh, responsibility about uh, uh, 15, 16 months ago, uh, I have, I've had a varied background. I was a diplomat and worked on intellectual property rights issues for the State Department, negotiating agreements all throughout Asia. Uh, I've also worked as a consultant, worked in private equity, run a fund focused on lending as, against intellectual property as an asset class. Um, a naked asset uh, so that it was its own source of collateral. Uh, and then coming to this after a rather varied background in intellectual property law and, and, uh, and business, I looked at this situation and, and thought this is truly an opportunity to, uh, to leave a mark uh, quietly, but, uh, but to leave a mark nonetheless. Uh, one of the key features about my stewardship of Open Invention Network is that uh, the goal is to work on the periphery of the community and not to invade in the uh, wonderfully elegant, uh, self-organizing, self-regulating nature of what the, the ecosystem really is. So we work on the periphery to ensure that patents don't have an impact um, insofar as we can. 
uh, utilizing creativity, capital, and uh, an ex experienced team that understands patenting and understands the challenges associated with litigation uh, related to patenting in the, in the current regulatory environment. Uh, but for me, the, the real appeal of Linux is that it is the, the single, it, it represents a modality for invention more so than it does for a technology in the way I view it. And, and because of its positioning as, a, as the, the single most significant economic, economically powerful open source initiative that uh, to a real extent every other initiative, whether it be parallel or, or, or serially behind, uh, actually is in the slipstream of uh, Linux. Doesn't, they don't necessarily live and die by Linux, but Linux is extremely important in how open source ultimately has received the receptivity uh, in the community, the attraction of capital, private equity. I just spoke at a venture capital conference in San Francisco last week. Uh, talking to VCs about the importance of investing in open source companies broadly and in Linux companies specifically. Some get it, some are starting to get it because they've typically looked at intellectual property as the critical component. They want that differentiation. And what I'm explaining to them is that it's really an environment which is open and closed. It's not open or closed. And you have to really understand that, that we're just going higher up in the stack in a collaborate, collaborative environment before we get to uh, layering on any kind of proprietary applications, if those are going to be layered on as part of a business model. Uh, from right to left, this is all uh, just kind of creating a visual view of what I just described. I think this is a, the great thing about open source is uh, from the early uh, 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 proselytization uh, from the, the 60s uh, and onward, uh, it's made eminent sense that uh, if you look at how uh, wireless technology evolved during the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, and into the 90s, we wasted an incredible amount of money uh, and we have lagged behind not only nationally but globally. There's been a lag uh, compared to where the technology was good enough to actually be implemented uh, seven to ten years before it actually was rolled out. Um, the U.S., of course, because we waited for CDMA, uh, was another two years behind that. So one of the things I, I see is this, uh, this incredible kind of starburst model of, of invention that ultimately yields new levels of value, new, new, where, uh, where the, siloed level, the siloed invention that we did on the, in, the, in the former former days where company A, company B, company C were involved in uh, inventing discreetly uh, and then basically having to cross-license each other after uh, usually months, if not years, of battling uh, over patent rights. Uh, obviously thwarted the ability of users to, gen to, to experience the benefits and for the macro economy to see the benefits of technology diffusion. Uh, and I think one of the great things about open source is that it creates connection points for people around the globe. I was at the OECD about a month ago in Paris and spoke to them about the, the whole notion of, of how this is one of the, the best, if not the best, aid program that anybody could possibly uh, create. And the great thing about it is it's not designed as an aid program, obviously. It's an unintended consequence that it creates engagement for the smartest and the best and the brightest, uh, the most creative people around the world to be able to participate. And for capital, for those people not to have to migrate, as most of the VCs in the world are, are uh, continuing to expect, migrating to Silicon Valley or to Route 128, uh, or to RTP or other places around the world that are technology centers, but rather for capital to flow to innovation where it resides, so it's invention in place rather than the uh, creating the uh, the dislocation that uh, invention has required, and uh, because of the, the the hegemony of capital uh, in a very few countries around the world. And I think this is one of the important uh, byproducts of this process, which is incredibly appealing to me because of my, my early career as a diplomat and my goal of wanting to see uh, development more broadly uh, uh, diffused and people who are extremely bright and talented in places around the world that I've, I've traveled and worked, to see those people actually engage around this, this uh, wonderfully elegant platform. Uh,
technology and, and the whole notion of, uh, of kind of parsing out your, your intangible assets has been something that while we don't value assets on the balance sheet yet, uh, we ultimately will. Uh, as an aside, uh, Brookings Institute did a study uh, in 1970 and then redid the study in 2000 and then it was, was updated by another firm about uh, three or four years ago and looked at the relative uh, component value in a company uh, based on looking at its market cap and disaggregating it and seeing what was related to hard assets and what was related to intangibles. Uh, it was basically 20% intangibles in 1970 and 80% hard assets. When they, they redid the study in 2000, they found it, was, it had completely flip-flopped. So 80% of the value was in intangibles and 20% was in hard assets. And I think in the, uh, the G8 countries, the G10 countries, that's increasingly the case as we move to uh, an advanced service economy where intellectual capital is the, is the single most significant source of value that can be contributed. And as a result, we've moved toward an environment where intellectual property as a codified form of intellectual capital, capital has actually uh, become far more significant and important in terms of, of the value of a company. Uh, when companies are acquired or when, co when assets are sold off, there's a lot more uh, clarity and focus on intangibles than there ever was uh, historically. And so with that, um, you have, uh, again, VCs with an acute focus on, on intellectual property as a source of differentiation. You've had a history of large and small companies inventing and codifying their inventions in the form of patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Please. Um, my understanding is that mathematical algorithms are not the source of Yeah, actually, algorithms, uh, if you look at security software, uh, one of the reasons you don't see algorithms is that they, they stay as trade secrets, but there are some algorithms that have actually been patented. They've been wrapped with other components, similar to what you're describing. I think it's a, just a, a comment. We, uh, we don't, I mean, we're supported by a bunch of very large companies, uh, IBM uh, among them, uh, Novell, Sony, uh, Red Hat, uh, companies that are, you know, they may patent something purely to open source it, uh, like Red Hat, or they may patent it and actually have very successful licensing programs like, uh, like IBM. Um, I think one of the challenges for the regulators uh, and the legislators right now who are creating what the regulatory roadmap will be uh, is figuring out what should be patented, what shouldn't be patented. Um, we kind of are, uh, we're in a position where we look at what is and we're less involved in, in remaking the future other than giving community members tools so that patents, no matter what the disposition is, whether it's the, the British Patent Office's view or the European Patent Office's view in Munich or the US Patent Office's view or JPO's view in Japan, whatever happens there, what we're trying to do is develop tools for the community to be proactive in codifying what it knows in an acceptable form that is not, pat not patentable, a non-patent-like non intellectual property asset. And what that does, if you, if, double, the double E community typically has had a certain discipline around the engineering notebook, probably because they're socialized in large companies for the most part as they grow up in codifying everything they have and they have these engineering notebooks. In a, in a computer science environment, both academically and professionally, there's less of that culture. And uh, I think one of the things that the double E community in general is, has benefited from is that culture because a lot of what they have they can invent in creative ways to ensure that no one can ever patent on top of them. So. I'm looking at it a little bit different way rather than kind of, you know, being another voice in Washington to say oh, we need to do this or we need to do that, you know, in terms of patent reform. I'm looking at it and saying regardless of what they do, 
they're not going to get it 100% right. It just doesn't. Legislative process is about compromise. You're not going to get what everybody wants, especially when you've got the competing interests of the electronics, telecommunications uh, industry, and communications industry in general, and you've got uh, the, the other path that's pursued by the pharmaceutical industry, which is also a heavily patenting, uh, heavy patent environment. And so in that situation, I'd rather work with the community to give them tools to protect themselves, regardless of what the policy is. That's just the approach we take. Uh, patent offices have granted software patents. You think that, you're, you know, based on the rhetoric, that there aren't software patents in Europe? That's not the case. Uh, there are, when you look closely, there are lots of software patents in Europe. Nowhere as near as many as there are in the U.S., but uh, be that as may, it's, it is a problem that actually is somewhat widespread. A reality of what we, what we deal with every day is that there are certain companies, uh, Microsoft in, in the example I've used here, uh, that whose behaviors, attitudes, um, uh, their DNA is uh, diametrically opposed to, uh, uh, to seeing open source as a model uh, prevail and Linux as a particular instantiation of open source uh, prevail as it's uh, obviously very threatening to the franchise. The franchise is where they make all their money. Um, not all, but most. Um, they may ge generate a lot of revenue in some of the new areas that they've grown over the last five years, uh, ten years, but uh, real profit comes from the franchise. And Ubuntu and, and other uh, open source applications are extremely threatening uh, to the core franchise and to the uh, the not so successful part of the franchise in the wireless space. Uh, Seven has another version coming out. Uh, there's another version of, of CE coming out in that family of, of wireless apps. They have their own device coming out in January on the Verizon network, which I think will be, by my count, the fourth hardware device that they'll have attempted to introduce. Uh, the, uh, the, the approach that they're taking now is uh, uh, multi-pronged. If you're a small company, you'll get a visitation um, that'll often be, uh, you'll get a call one day, you'll get a visit the next day as, a, as a evidence of the importance of, uh, of this particular visit, which is essentially a, uh, what would be termed in patent uh, jargon a assertion, where they'll talk about their patents uh, in very general terms and uh, then come in and visit the company and, uh, and be very demonstrative about how that company, uh, these are companies, small companies, I'm talking about companies with as little as $750,000 or a million dollars in, in gross revenue per year, not profit. Uh, these are companies that are not terribly successful, web hosting companies. There, there are a variety of web hosting companies that, have, that run Linux who have been approached. Um, and they're encouraged to sign an NDA, which you should never sign an NDA. You should get legal, legal counsel if you're approached by anyone who's asserting their patents, uh, in particular if it's Microsoft. Uh, what we're trying to do is educate people to what their rights are. And uh, it's very difficult because you've got a multi-billion dollar uh, behemoth that's uh, standing across the desk from you in a uh, nice shiny suit that's telling you that... Uh, that you're in violation of uh, their patents and that they have patents that are relevant to Linux and that if you want to continue to run Linux, you're going to have to take a license from them or they're going to put you out of business. Uh, in point of fact, they don't put people out of business. Uh, they, uh, they like to huff and puff. And, and, uh, but it, it is a rather insidious uh, approach that they take overall. That's one, one aspect. Other companies that are uh, major customers where they have very good relationships because they have multiple seats of Windows, uh, they'll go to those companies and they'll talk to them about uh, the idea of partnership and how they have these patents that read on Linux and they know that the, the company, company A, uh, is also, in addition to their Microsoft seats, uh, are also using Linux in a variety of application areas and increasingly using Linux and hate to see that they would problem, there would be problems developed between such a, uh, a long-standing partner um, and that you should really take a license. And, and by the way, to make it easy, we'll subsidize the license. We'll just reduce your per seat cost for the next two years, and we'll call it a specific license, and you'll sign a license agreement, and there'll be specific patents that you're taking a license to. This is part of their totem building strategy. This all is what I'm describing is, is what I've characterized as a totem building strategy. 
No one in any of the situations that I'll describe looks at the patents. That's not what this is about. This is a form of... Uh, uh, well, it's a... It's a, it's a uh, encouragement or dis in discouragement from non uh, from uh, nonconforming behavior. Uh, that uh, that they are very uh, skilled in uh, in bringing forward. Right now, they uh, they just did a tour of uh, of Japan and Korea. You may have noticed that LG took one of these licenses that says now they're safe for Linux because they've uh, they've taken a license from Microsoft. Microsoft, no doubt, needed some of the patents that, uh, that LG has in, in the wireless space, in the device space, and in the display space, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically hoodwinked them into taking a license to these very valuable Linux patents in return for gaining access to patents that actually uh, uh, LG had, which are far more valuable than the Linux patents that, uh, that are being hawked. The whole notion is you take... The fat patents, just like they did in the in the TomTom Tom case, you wrap them with the four or five other, ten other uh, patents that look like they might read on the, and maybe they are reads, on uh, core activities and applications of the individual company you're targeting, uh, and then you uh, you attempt to uh, create a situation which uh, I'll just run through the math for you, so understand how this works when you're on the receiving end. Uh, TomTom Tom was in a situation where uh, uh, a, uh, a an international um, uh, uh, ITC action was filed, which cost you anywhere from eight to ten million dollars to defend. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's at least eight to ten million dollars. Always, uh, it's everything's on an accelerated time schedule, and the real risk is injunction. So you can't afford to be enjoined when. The, the, the setting, TomTom's Tom -tom's like Kleenex in the, uh, in the nav space, more so than, than how we view uh, uh, Garmin here. TomTom, uh, -tom, you're going to TomTom something. It's like, a, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the Google set the tone and, and other players have followed it. And, and the community, whenever you're in Britain or you're in the Netherlands or in other countries in Europe, if they want to find something that your, your location that you're trying to find that they don't know offhand, they'll say they'll tom tom it, uh, and that's what they do. It's they have 62% market share, wonderful access to the market, a, mar an ac a market that that Microsoft covets. Microsoft approached them uh, in a in a very passive way, uh, had no active discussions or negotiations. Uh, and then uh, they received a note in, I guess it was February of this year, maybe it was March, that, uh, that they were being sued. Uh, and then uh, we uh, worked with them. They had very good counsel work with them. Uh, and uh, the program was, the settlement was that you either settle for something which is, non which is not material by, uh, um, for uh, reporting uh, purposes from a, uh, uh, a, a um, Netherlands or Holland-based uh, um, uh, uh, publicly traded market standards, uh, standard, and so it's it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You either sign up, and we can put you on the totem, or it's going to cost you eight to ten million dollars to defend the the first ITC action we brought. And then the suit that we filed in, uh, in uh, Western Washington uh, is going to cost you another five million dollars, three and a half to five million dollars to defend. So when you're faced with capitulating and allowing them to do the press release, uh, which is really part and parcel of that's what they want. They want to control the press release. This is, this, is the inner, this is the inner workings of how this all plays out. So when you read a press release, the LG's press release, LG didn't do anything on the press release. They just looked at it and said, yeah, we coordinated on it. Um, but the key was for every one of these totems that, they've, that they have uh, is ultimately they're building these totems. They're going to erect them in, you know, for the team picture in, in Redmond. And then they're going to say, well, look at all these companies that have taken a license. These companies, um, they've got really ex kind of expensive IP talent around them. They've got long experience in intellectual property. Uh, development, uh, you know, all these companies can't be wrong, and this, this, this is, there's, 
they're essentially creating the rebuttable presumption that everyone has to take a license because their position is so relevant in the market. Again, it, no one ever looks at the patents. We're looking at the patents. Um, and we're inviting the community to participate in looking at those patents. Every time they show a patent, it'll be up on, on something that we, we have in the Linux Defenders, which is post-issue period of patent. Patents that are of low quality, that shouldn't be out in the marketplace, that we want to invalidate. We want crowdsourcing. We want the community to participate, identify prior art so that we can request re-exams and have those patents eliminated from the, the take another arrow out of the quiver of companies. Again, it's a category of companies and Microsoft is used as, a, as the most significant because it's the largest and the most threatened by what Linux represents. But the whole notion is to, uh, to look for bad patents that are held by antagonistic companies that represent uh, uh, a source of irritant to the Linux community. The, the key thing is that this is, the open source community is so much more mature than it was five, six, seven years ago. Uh, SCO was a, was a mild uh, uh, kind of, uh, it was a significant episode, but in retrospect, if you put SCO in the context of today, SCO would be managed very easily without kind of creating the gross fear, uncertainty, and doubt that, uh, that Microsoft lives on. Uh, so I think those days are really gone, and it's an attitudinal thing as well as a sense of maturity and the fact that, that players have come into the community who are helping to navigate. It's not just OIN, it's, it's, it's Free Software Foundation Europe, it's SFLC, and, uh, and it's also the Linux Foundation. There are a variety of players that have come together with capital and with commitments of large, mid- and small comp mid size and small companies and developers, the individual developer, uh, representing their interests to make sure that, that the market develops in the way the market's going to develop without putting fingerprints on it and saying it needs to go this way. That's why I'm so, first, off the bat, I want to make sure that everybody understands it's not, I'm not uh, hawking for the six companies that, I, that actually have funded the fund that I, that I manage. Uh, the activities that I'm involved in, they, were, they have a board which aids in guiding my activities. But we have autonomy to use capital to make a difference, to do what's necessary to ensure that Linux is free and open and that it can develop as, as the community sees appropriate. That's the great thing about it. It's not one company dictating how the community is going to develop or how a technology or an application is going to develop. Um, and so. Uh, we kind of view it as a, as a point, uh, we're kind of past the point where Microsoft or others who are antithetical to true innovation uh, and would like to have us be suborned to uh, and uh, relegated to the incremental, the levels of incremental innovation that they uh, dole out periodically. Uh, in order to be positioned well, uh, in order for them to be successful in, in accomplishing what they'd like to accomplish, which is to slow or stall, uh, the day is gone. Uh, the horse is out of the barn, and it's, uh, it's miles away from, from where they're able to, uh, to track it down. And one of the key things is, uh, the reasons for that is it's, it's a social, it's a social uh, phenomenon as much as it is a technologically de development approach or anything else. People collaborating together, creating new, new, creating higher forms of value by thinking together. It's the idea of one plus one equals three or five or ten, but it doesn't equal two anymore when you, when you work together in a collaborative environment in, in open source in Linux. Uh, and that phenomenon is so powerful uh, that it seized the, the, the attention of, of people in Washington, in the new administration, in former administrations, as well as people in the European Commission, people in, in JPO, people in India, Brazil, China, everywhere around the world, people recognize the value of open source and the value of Linux and, uh, and the, uh, the irritants that, uh, that Microsoft and, and other uh, uh, operational uh, kind of initiatives that they have underway are, are simply that, and that's why we're here, and that's why some of those other organizations are around, is to make sure that we're able to broadcast and narrowcast the message. Um, I view myself as, a, as someone who has to proselytize the importance of, of community participation, uh, and I'll talk about some of the programs that I think the community can participate in. Can yes? Challenge 
discontinuous innovation. Well, I'd like to challenge that too, because I think Microsoft is all in favor of discontinuous innovation when they, when they control it. Um, I do a lot of work with open innovation in big companies. And one of the things that we ask them to do is draw what we call a project diagram, or the Michelin, for example. Mm -hmm. And in the center of that are the things that are the most strategic to them. In their case, it's literally their secret sauce, it's rubber. They don't talk to anybody about it. And if you were to challenge Michelin there, they would do it, they'd act just like Microsoft. Outside that circle are things that are still strategic to them, molding, but they may not be the best in the world. So a little bit more open to be willing to be open, but there are going to be attorneys involved. And then most everything else is things that they're very comfortable, environmental standards. Quite frankly, they want to find an expert. They don't want to do it themselves. And so they're willing to be open in the way you talk about in things that aren't a part of that core. Um, and I agree with you know pretty much how you said going about the approach, but I think it's important when you think about a company to kind of understand why they're reacting the way they are. I mean, you're kind of poke them in the core there, they're going to fight back, and that's what Microsoft's doing. And yet, at the same time, they can be very defensive there. They can actually be very open in other places. And the more you can kind of understand where they're willing to be open and where they're yeah. willing to fight. I, I, you know, I think they, they need to be open where Apple needs to be open. Apple needs to be open at the edge to get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of developers around their platforms. But my view is that yeah, yeah. Well, the culture is more closed. Um, but they are open in that respect because application development needs to be – innovation happens at the edge. It doesn't happen at the core, whether it's Michelin, whether it's Bridgestone, or any other company. You get 500 people in a company, and you've already started to move away from the kinds of discontinuous innovation that creates new market or radically redefines existing ones. That's what I'm looking for is those opportunities. And – that's why in, in, in university education, uh, if you think you're going to find the edge of what's happening in business management at Harvard, it, you're not. Um, it's the places that they draw ideas from because the edge of any, any – whenever you get to the center, you lose the opportunity for – this is kind of a separate discussion on, on – it's that same form – it's the same diagram that was used at, at Tuck about 35, 40 years ago. Uh, as to describe starburst models of, of innovation. And that's what, I mean, the, actually the CTO at, uh, at Microsoft understands this very well because it's like an absolutely worthless company. Lotus is absolutely worthless. You could have just shut, you, you pay the power bill, that's about it. Because 123 had been, had been run down by Microsoft like a tank in the early 90s. Uh, the only thing they had left were 13 entities that they set up outside that were all managed, <clears throat> designed by uh, Jim Manzi and managed by Ray Ozzi. One of them happened to be Notes. They got $4 billion for a company that otherwise would have been worthless through only three and a half years of development. That's, that's the starburst model of organization writ large. Uh, Thermo Electron, there are a whole bunch of other companies that use it because you can't innovate at the levels you want to inside companies. But it's a little bit of a divergence, but I'm more than happy to talk about innovation strategy offline. Um, data turn, this is a suit that was uh, brought last April 21st, uh, was settled in about uh, 10, 12 weeks by uh, the defendant, in this case was Red Hat and uh, 25 of its closest uh, and largest customers. One of the things that's happening is that uh, as Linux is becoming more, uh, more prevalent in uh, large, deep-pocketed uh, uh, users, that uh, trolls have become attracted to the opportunity space. Trolls are companies who are generally, well, generally, uh, non-practicing entities. Uh, sometimes they're formally practicing entities, companies who uh, we think about uh, a company like... Uh, Qualcomm as being very successful. Clearly, they developed a standard. The government facilitated them actually being the, uh, the adopted standard. Uh, but they, in point of fact, they're a failure as an operating company. Their operational strategy was to be a hardware maker that also did licensing. 
They got out of that business because they recognized they're not good at it. So in some sense, they're a formerly practicing entity that's utilizing their patent portfolio creatively to be able to support technology development. And they do reinvest in technology development. Uh, but more traditional trolls are Amphion is the owner of DataTurn. They picked up DataTurn uh, and, uh, and are looking to, had been looking to leverage the intellectual property assets. They filed suit against Red Hat, uh, B of A, a whole series of banks and uh, travel-related entities online and, uh, and brick and mortar. And they ultimately uh, put, put forward a program designed to uh, uh, whatever word you want to use. Uh, litigation avoidance uh, is really what uh, litigation cost avoidance is really what a troll is about. They know it costs you between three and a half and five million dollars to defend a suit, to take it to term, to, to jury. Uh, and if they can settle, like uh, one of the leading trolls is Acacia. Acacia right now uh, has 36 active lawsuits going concurrently against different defendants. Uh, it buys patents or co-ops, owners, assignees of patents, owners of patents, uh, to uh, get into a fee splitting arrangement and manages through a series of uh, contingency lawyer and uh, analyst relationships uh, a network of individuals and they bring suit. That's their business. They, build, they do no technology development. Um, they purely uh, flip patents for the purpose of creating uh, revenue for their shareholders. They're a publicly traded company uh, based in California. And, uh, they have a suit against, uh, which is application related. It's not really a Linux suit, but it's against uh, Red Hat as well. Um, and uh, there are a series of these suits that really are not salient to the kernel, but they deal with core applications that are maybe uniquely enabled by the kernel, uh, by, the, by Linux. Uh, they're not of grave concern, other than that they represent an annoyance and they mislead uh, People like Jamie Dimon, who uh, has a rather significant network. Jamie Dimon runs uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. If it's going to discourage him, he's a guy that reads the headlines. He doesn't read below the headline. He gets his information from his people on a lot of areas, or he picks up the phone if he wants to know about something and can access pretty much anybody. But if he's not going to stroke, if he's going to hesitate on a $10 million check for an install of Linux to upgrade some aspect of their network operations, because he's concerned that Linux is, you know, there are a lot of lawsuits related to Linux. Um, it's, it's not the reality, it's the perception of reality that we have to be concerned about as well, at least in my position I am. So one of the things I look to do is interdite troll behavior by getting in front of them. Uh, we have several lawsuits that we have staved off by uh, working with trolls and either identifying significant prior art and the patents they were going to assert so that they uh, they went back and uh, reconsidered their position, or we've, uh, we've negotiated agreements uh, uh, at very modest terms to take patents off the table that otherwise would have been used for these, uh, uh, these what I'll consider one thin claim lawsuits, because that's about all, what, uh, it's about all you need to actually sustain a lawsuit sufficient to, uh, to get your payoff. Acacia settlements are averaged from 700,000 to, to 1.3 million. Um, because it represents an avoidance of going forward with litigation. You actually save money by, by succumbing to their extortionate uh, practices. And so this is, this is something that the patent reform is looking to address uh, and all of the companies that, that are represented uh, as the investors in OIN and, and, and hundreds of other companies have real concerns with the, uh, the impact on innovation uh, and, the, and the cost effectiveness of, uh, or the cost uh, detriment that uh, is yielded by uh, the continued proliferation of uh, troll models. Um, Amphion, as I said earlier, Acacia I described, Rembrandt is a very focused troll. Uh, they buy all their portfolios and they do maybe two or three uh, uh, litigation actions a year. Uh, they're uh, generally a lot more thorough than the other two. And then Intellectual Ventures has a, for those of you don't, not aware, I have them in parens because it's not, it's not clear that they are a troll. 
They have not asserted and litigated against, uh, against anyone. They've asserted, actually, they haven't litigated, um, which is basically bringing their patents out and saying that you're, you're going to need our patents to continue to run your business. Uh, but they haven't litigated. Uh, but they have gathered over the, since 2000 when they formed, they've invested over $4 billion. They have, uh, well, they haven't invested over $4 billion. They have still some of that capital. But they, they raised $4 billion and they've acquired 24,900 patents by last count, uh, which is a very significant uh, number of patents. Uh, they have four funds. Uh, wow. Yeah. They lobby well each company? Excuse me? They lobby well each company? Um, Intellectual Ventures is very interesting. Um, it's uh, Nathan Mirvold, who used to be the uh, uh, CTO of Microsoft, who is a friend of Bill, not so much a friend of the current administration, but uh, he and Bill were uh, thick as thieves and, and really support the whole idea of, of innovation in, 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 you know, at, a, at a high level. I think to your point, they were, I mean, you can't, you can't get away from the fact that if it were not for Microsoft, we would not be where we are with personal computing. I mean, a major innovation was stewarded by that company. Um, the problem is when you're a monopolist, you act as a monopolist and when you have no role models, it's very difficult to have any expectation. If your only role model is a company that, uh, that basically had us flying around in, uh, in technology that was 30 years old uh, until uh, the, uh, the Europeans got together and decided to do something about it, um, it just doesn't make for a great environment. I mean, as independent and, and, uh, and fiercely, uh, fiercer competitors John Chambers is at Cisco, um, the legacy of, of, uh, of Hewlett and Packard and the, uh, the, 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 the appropriateness of a model of, of operation of a business was laid out by uh, Hewlett and Packard as well as by, uh, by Varian early on in, uh, in the Valley. And there was a, a certain code and a certain uh, kind of social compact of appropriate behavior. Uh, even Larry Ellison in his better days is... Uh, is uh, you know understands that that code very very well. In fact, he's a student of that code. Um, but uh, I think the uh, the key here is what what will happen. We don't know, but uh, I think it bears watching because they have a very significant storehouse of patents. Uh, and in response, defensive patent pools have arisen, and these patent pools you can expect to work together in the future uh, because. It's all about dealing with the billions of dollars that have been raised on the other side in some sense. It's a very inefficient process because on the one side you've got corporate troll activity, as I've described from Microsoft, and, uh, and, and, and traditional, what has become traditional, non-practicing entity troll activity. On the other side, if you've got OIN in a very focused uh, defensive patent pool, uh, again, with our acute focus on Linux, and then Allied Security Trust, their first fund, and RPX. Each of them have to, each entity has different uh, v ways of, of proceeding. We don't generate uh, any profit. Uh, we don't generate any revenue. Um, we don't break even. We don't attempt to break even. Uh, ours is a uh, this is a mission uh, to uh, to ensure that there's a level playing field and that open source and Linux survives. Allied Security Trust represents the interests of a select group of companies. RPX represents the interests of a select group of companies as well, but they're acutely focused on generating profit. But nonetheless, because they have a, in their, their bylaws the inability to assert and litigate, uh, they're, uh, they're someone that can be worked with. They tend to buy patents that are uh, of lower quality, uh, not always, but uh, generally ones that, that are troll bait, that trolls would love to have because they represent potentially large uh, settlement opportunities or many, many uh, suit opportunities. Uh, clearly, uh, what's going on in the patent world is a... Skip ahead to this. From two sides, there's a bit of convergence. Large companies, IBM, uh, Philips of the Netherlands, uh, uh, Motorola, Nokia, Siemens, uh, Ericsson, all those companies are, have independently come to the conclusion that uh, 
just patenting for patenting's sake is no longer the way forward. Uh, and what they've started to do is reduce the number of, of, of patent applications that they file uh, and start to increase the number of defensive publications. Defensive publications are in some sense an anti-patent for the open source community and in another sense for a large company that is seeking to grow a patent portfolio it's a far more cost-effective way of ensuring that you're uh, you're practicing appropriate intellectual property rights management. Uh, the patents, when you have a really good patent you want to wrap it with the reason why you develop all these other patents is you're building a family. The family is essentially protecting the, there are all these child patents around this core, but you're protecting the patent from being attacked, having its core claims attacked and being weakened by third parties who come later with other inventions that look at the extensions of, of the core claims. And in this situation, In this situation, you've got, uh, I just couldn't see the two, sorry. Uh, in this situation, you have uh, a combination of patenting and defensive publications. You've got the core patent, you wrap it with defensive publications, which are not things that can restrict people's behaviors, uh, other companies' behaviors. They're essentially uh, st statements that are very much like, they, have, they don't have claims, but they're very much like a patent. They would otherwise be patentable, except they don't have claims. But the, the interesting thing about them and why I think they're particularly relevant to the open source community is because these uh, defensive publications can never be used to restrict the behaviors of others, uh, but they do represent prior art. So if we get the community, if all the developers in the community would start to codify what they know and what they've invented, we wouldn't have three or four or five years later someone inventing the same thing that they invented and then having everybody be upset and think that the patent system stinks. Uh, yeah. So is, I mean, publishing the code does what the defensive publication describes, is that not enough? Well, where are you going to publish it, though? Well, I mean, working code ships. Yeah, it, uh, it's not enough because the key piece that's missing is that it's not accessible to patent and trademark office examiners. So the patent examiner has to find it, and we can't rely on Google. No matter how evolved Google gets, and I know Chris Bone is here, we're not going to get there <laughs> because this is something that's extremely challenging. To, to, you've got to basically deliver it on a platter. There's something called IP.com. We bear all the costs of the creation of, def, of these defensive publications. We're inviting the community in to participate. We're doing, I'm running out of time, but essentially this program at the bottom, Linux Defenders, is one of the things I want to emphasize today is that we're looking at poor quality applications to get to eliminate those through peer to patent. That's what that's about. Go to the website and look at it if you get a chance. Post issue peer to patent, as I described earlier, bad patents that have already been granted. We want to eliminate those, so we need the crowdsourcing support to identify prior art, contribute it. We'll make sure that it's 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 useful uh, in defeating these patents in in uh, the invalidating patents that exist. Defensive publications, essentially, what I'm just describing. If we codified what we knew, then we'd get so much prior art that we wouldn't get people getting patents on things that are well known. Yes? Why can't the Linux community go the route of BSD and just identify all the disputed code and replace it with completely new code that's not based on any of the um, disputed patents? Chase your tail forever. Yeah. Chase your tail forever. I mean, there, I think it's, there's just, you know, rather than kind of get wrapped around the axle about that question, I mean, BSD comes up all the time in discussions, particularly in Europe. Um, but it, it's not something, if you, if you could go back to the beginning, that's different. But you can't kind of, in, the, in midstream, go back and do that efficiently. Um, so these are essentially the programs. These slides will be available for people who want, want access to them. What we're trying to provide is freedom of action and freedom to operate. And that's why we're trying to get the community mobilized to actually codify its inventions in, an, in a socially acceptable way by the, by the community's ethic. And that's what defensive publications represent. Uh, and again, it's the whole idea of one plus one does not equal just two. But by working together, we can deal with these patent issues, and we can also deal with some of the broader issues of, of you know, where Linux is going. If you don't have to worry about patent issues, which is what we're trying to do, we think the community is going to be much healthier in terms of developing its own kind of shadow roadmap of where it needs to go uh, in some of the key areas. Uh, uh, so 
anyway, part of what I'm proposing is, is market-led patent reform. Let's not let, the, let legislators and regulators and the judiciary try and solve the problem themselves. If we participate by utilizing defensive publications and utilizing these other tools under Linux Defenders, we're going to be in a lot better position than we are right now. Uh, and that's my mobile number. Anyone, anytime should feel free to call me, no matter where they are in the world. I listen to people, you know, we're, we have something called Linux Defenders 911, uh, and uh, we take it very seriously. We get a lot of good leads about lawsuits or people who are being, being bothered in patent issues. Um, we're, we want to be uh, as immersed in the community as we can, given the fact that we live on its border, patrolling the border to make sure patents don't affect the way of life of people who are contributing to this, uh, this incredibly vital community. Thank you very much for your time. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.